Great. Uh, so I'm John Dench. As Dave mentioned, I'm a screening scientist in the RNAi platform. I also uh, do a lot of our R&D stuff. Uh, so what I want to talk about in this section is sort of an overview of the reagents that are available on the platform, uh, a little bit of history of how RNAi was discovered. Uh, but I really want you to get a sense from here, like you know what. What can you get? What can you do in the platform? What's the sort of nuts and bolts that if you're about to start a project in the lab, uh, how, how can we help with that? Uh, so first, the discovery of RNAi. You know, <laughs> every, everything on some level begins with Gregor Mendel in biology, right? You know, asking the question, what is a gene? Uh, you know, from like 1850 to 1900, that was sort of the, the main question of biology uh, as, as it was. W what is a gene? Uh, and, and, and a pretty simple definition is it's a molecular unit of heredity. Uh, and I should point out this XKCD comic was actually true in my case. Uh, my wife is also a biologist, and by our like second or third date, we were starting to figure out that hmm, we might have a blue-eyed child, and we did. Uh, but then, you know, at, past the time of Gregor Mendel, now does anyone know who this guy on the left is? Anyone recognize that? Anyone? No one. Morgan, right, exactly, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Uh, so he was the first person to use fruit flies as a model organism at his lab in, uh, at Columbia University, I think. Uh, and, and he was the first person to realize that, that genes, or these heritable traits, existed in a physical place. And they existed in a physical place on a chromosome. And what his lab largely did was to take traits of Drosophila. Uh, yellow body, scaly bristles, white eyes, facet eyes, ruby eyes, cut wings, single bristle. All these are various traits uh, that they observed in mutant flies. And started to figure out, OK, where are these traits on the chromosome? So genes first were identified as a, a unit of information, and then they were physically placed on chromosomes. Uh, but that doesn't really give you a lot of sense for, you know, mechanistically or, 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 or physically, what is a gene? Uh, and then obviously, uh, you know, starting in, in the 1950s, you know, I, uh, with Watson and Crick figuring out that the, the DNA was the carrier of the genetic material, and then messenger RNA and protein, we start to get a sense for molecularly what, what a gene is. Uh, and then you want to ask the question, what are all the genes, right? And that, that led to the Human Genome Project, which was published, the first draft was published in 2001. Uh, and obviously, this institute contributed greatly to that, or the precursor of this institute. Uh, what are all the genes? Okay. So that's where we were by 2001. The sequence of the human genome was completed. And it's very easy to look at sequences, you know, if you have the sequence of the human genome, to say, OK, let's identify genes computationally, right? You can look for protein coding regions. You can look for uh, likely splice uh, sites, you know, exons and introns. You can look for promoters. So you can generate, OK, here's a list of all the genes. Here's the sequence of them. And here's the protein that they would then be translated into. Uh, but that doesn't tell you what the gene does. It just tells you what the sequence of it is. So what do these genes do? How do you even begin to answer that question? Uh, well, that's what geneticists do, right? Uh, they usually determine the function of a gene by breaking it. In the same way that, you know, if this is the back of your TV and you've got all jumble of wires back there and you have no idea, like, okay, which of these is the DVD player? Which of these is the Roku? Which of these is the, my old VHS recorder? Uh, you just yank it out and you figure out, oh, okay, that must have been the DVD player because now the DVD doesn't work anymore. Or you yank this out, oh, that must have been the cable box because now the cable no longer works. Uh, so you can determine the function of a gene by breaking it. And that's what Thomas Hunt Morgan was doing and a lot of geneticists were doing for, you know, 100 years. You mutagenize your model organism, whether it's fly, worm, yeast, or whatever, uh, with x-rays or chemicals. You look for an interesting property and then you map the gene involved. Now, gene mapping is, uh, Probably not something done too much anymore, you know, old chromosome walking and whatnot. Uh, now you can just sequence the thing and, and figure out what, what the mutation is. But you go from a phenotype to a sequence. And you realize, oh, OK, this particular nucleotide change then leads to this particular amino acid change. And now I understand why this mutant protein is giving me a different phenotype. Uh, but that's not what we want to do with the human genome, right? We already have the sequence of the gene. So we want to start with the sequence and determine its function by breaking it. And that's forward genetics. Uh, and just kind of coincidentally, that's about when RNAi was discovered. So we had this sequence of the human genome. Uh, and right around the same time, RNAi was discovered and allowed us to now answer this question of what happens when you break a gene uh, in mammalian cells. 
So how was RNAi discovered? Well, it, it basically started with a pretty simple idea of, OK, we have DNA, kind of hard to figure out how to tinker with DNA, but DNA gets transcribed into messenger RNA. What if we were to add to cells an antisense oligonucleotide? You know, we know the sequence of the messenger RNA. We can transcribe a, an RNA that is antisense to it. That should work, right? You know, the basic idea is this antisense RNA will bind to the messenger RNA. It'll form a duplex. Uh, and that will gunk things up. You know, maybe it'll be degraded by RNase H. Uh, maybe it'll interfere with translation, because translation works on single-stranded RNA, not double-stranded RNA. Uh, so maybe this will work. Uh, so it was simple, and people tried it. Uh, and it did work, kind of. Okay? And the, the kind of led to a Nobel Prize. So in 1998, Andy Fire and Craig Mello started their Nature paper. Uh, this is the abstract. Despite the usefulness of RNAi, or what they were calling RNA interference, which was injecting antisense RNA into C. elegans, despite the usefulness of RNAi and C. elegans, features of the process have been difficult to explain. Sense and antisense RNA preparations are each sufficient to cause interference. So that should have sent up a red flag, and it did for these guys. You know, the mechanism by which RNAi works should only be the antisense should be the only thing that works. If you inject sense RNA into a worm, you shouldn't, you shouldn't interfere with the function of the phenotype. But that's what they were seeing in their, in their experiments. So you inject antisense, you get a decently good knockdown phenotype, <clears throat> but you also see that with sense RNA. So that didn't make any sense. They then reasoned, though, that RNA populations to be injected are generally prepared using bacteriophage RNA polymerases. So you buy the message machine from Ambion. It comes with T7 polymerase. Uh, you take your DNA template, T7, add T7 RNA polymerase, and make your in vitro transcribed RNA. These polymerases, although highly specific, produce some random or ectopic transcripts. So you know, the T7 polymerase should bind to a specific place and transcribe there. But sometimes it'll bind somewhere else on your DNA and start transcribing. From these facts, we surmise that the interfering RNA populations might include some molecules with double-stranded character. So observation that didn't make sense. Both sense, sense and antisense trigger the RNA interference. And hmm, maybe the polymerases we're using are producing some double-stranded RNA. So let's try it. In vitro transcribed sense, in vitro transcribed antisense, mix them together, stick them into a worm, and see what happens. And won a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, so they, they started with a gene UNC22. Uh, UNC stands for uncoordinated. Uh, so this is a muscle phenotype. And you can see, for, this is actually, if you look at this paper, it's like two tables and two figures. It's not a very fascinating paper to read. Because it, it, it's, I mean, you can just imagine this, right? I mean, you come up with this idea on Monday. You know the answer by Friday. Or maybe you, you, know, you, you spend a couple days in vitro transcribing your RNA, you inject the worms on Friday, come back in the lab on Monday, and you're like, oh my god, this actually worked. Uh, so they take the sense, inject it, they get the wild type phenotype, nothing has changed. They take the antisense, inject it, they get the wild type phenotype, nothing changes. But they mix sense and antisense together, and now you get the knockout phenotype. These guys are strong twitchers. Uh, they then, of course, try it with a bunch of other genes. Uh, they do it on some reporters. Uh, so here's uh, GFP expressing uh, worm on the, on the left, where they put in unrelated RNA, so double-strand RNA targeting UNC22. But then they put in the GFP double-strand RNA, and the worm is now totally not green. Uh, so for that, they won a Nobel Prize in 2006, I think. So eight years from discovering a Nobel Prize, not bad. So how does RNAi work? You know, very quickly the mechanism was worked out. You know, the, the double-strand RNA that you're introducing gets processed by an enzyme called DICER uh, into these SI RNAs, or short interfering RNAs. These short interfering RNAs are recognized by a protein complex called RISC for RNA-induced silencing complex. RISC basically picks one strand of the SI RNA and uses that strand as a guide to find messenger RNAs that share the same sequence. And if it has the same sequence, then that messenger RNA is cut by risk, and you no longer have expression of your gene. So that's the, the mechanism of RNAi. And again, here's the, here's the structure of the siRNA. It's 19 bases of duplex, and then two nucleotides of overhang uh, 
uh, on the three prime end. So that's how RNA works. But you might ask, well, why do cells bother doing this in the first place? It's very useful for researchers, but why do cells do this? Why did this evolve? Uh, and and a, lo a lot of data uh, really suggests that it, it, it initially evolved as a way to defend the genome against genetic elements such as transposons. So one feature of transposons is that they almost always, and a lot of uh, retroviruses as well, uh, have inverted repeats at the ends. Okay? So an inverted repeat, when it's transcribed, can fold back on itself and form a double-strand RNA structure. So you can certainly imagine how, from an evolutionary perspective, it would be very good for cells to evolve away to, or evolve away to eliminate double-strand RNA, because double-strand RNA is a sign that you have a transposon trying to hop around, or you have a virus that's trying to replicate, or something like that. So that appears to be how it evolved. And again, RNAi is a, a basically a universal mechanism in eukaryotes. It's found in plants. It's found in uh, you know, every model organism, plants, flies, worms, mammalian cell culture, most yeast. Uh, although not cerevisiae, sadly enough. Uh, and RNA is, is pretty ubiquitous. Now, at the same time, and I, I just want to give this brief timeline because we're going to talk about microRNAs uh, a little bit throughout the, throughout the day. Uh, the discovery of microRNAs really started in 1993, where Victor Ambrose and Gary Rubkin independently uh, they had a gene. Again, they had a phenotype. And this phenotype was a lineage, a developmental phenotype in C. elegans. And you know, you, when you do a screen, you get a whole list of genes, and you name them LIN1, LIN2, LIN3, LIN4, meaning here, here's a worm, here's another worm, here's another worm, here's another worm. Uh, but they had a gene, LIN4, that for the longest time they could not map how this, you know, what, what is the mutation in this worm that is causing this lineage phenotype. Uh, and they eventually, we're able to figure out that LIN4 coded for a small RNA, okay, a 22 nucleotide RNA, and that LIN4 regulated LIN14 by binding to its 3' UTR. It took a long time to figure that out. Uh, so that was in 1993. They finally, you know, they have this one example of this, this one gene in C. elegans that was a small RNA. Uh, but then in 1998, Fire and Mello discover RNAi. Uh, so the plant people started getting to this, so David Balcom's group uh, discovered small RNAs during a kind of related process that in plants was known as PTGS, or post-transcriptional gene silencing. But it had a lot of the same hallmarks of, okay, you're using this in, in plants, I, I believe, if I remember right, they were triggering it with a virus, so something that could have some double-strand RNA, and then they were seeing the appearance of these small RNAs on their gel. Uh, then in 2000, Gary Rubkin's group, so uh, same guy, discovered that another gene in C. elegans, LET7, again, it had a lethal phenotype. Uh, LET7 was also a small RNA. Okay, so now there's two genes that are small RNAs. And in the same year, uh, a lot of work here at, uh, over across the street at MIT discovered that RNAi was mediated by the siRNAs that I showed in the other slide. So you have some endogenous genes that are small RNAs. We have this exogenous RNAi process that uses small RNAs. Uh, so then in 2001, several papers were published asking, OK, we know two examples of small RNAs. How ubiquitous are these things? And it turns out they're quite ubiquitous. And that, these came to be known as microRNAs. It's a family of small RNAs that exist in our genome, in the human genome. Uh, there are definitely at least 1,000 microRNAs. And, and with the advent of deep sequencing, the number might be much higher than that. It's, it's hard to say. Uh, but there are lots of endogenous genes that function as a small RNA, so that, that are transcribed, processed, and silenced genes uh, uh, endogenously. So that's, that's microRNAs, because that's, that's the discovery of RNAi. So that, that's where we were in 2001. There's this endogenous process in cells that you can use to silence genes. And the question then becomes, well, can we use it, right? I mean, that's one great thing about biology. You know, someone discovers restriction enzymes as, oh, this is a cool little thing that bacteria do to prevent one species of bacteria from invading another. Wait a minute. We can purify these restriction enzymes and use it to cut DNA where we want. You know, so a discovery one day becomes a tool the next day. And that certainly happened with RNAi. The idea that, okay, we, can, we know this process exists. How can we use it to study gene function? Uh, so what are the different ways of triggering RNAi? Uh, now, I'm only going to talk about how how it's done in mammalian cells, because that, that's, that's our focus. Uh, but you, again, you can do this in, in pretty much all organisms. Uh, 
This is the microRNA path, the endogenous microRNA pathway. So you start with a transcript that folds back onto itself as a hairpin. This gets processed by an enzyme known as Drosha. Drosha then gives you this uh, processed hairpin. That processed hairpin is exported uh, into the cytoplasm, where it's then recognized by Dicer, the same Dicer that works in the canonical RNAi double-strand RNA pathway. Uh, Dicer, Dicer processes it up into a duplex, and then RISC picks one strand of the duplex uh, for silencing. Uh, so delivery in mammalian cells is basically a question of where do you enter the pathway. Some libraries use microRNA-like delivery. So they use RNA polymerase II to transcribe a longer RNA that gets processed by Dicer, and then by, Di by Drosha, and then by Dicer, and then gets incorporated into RISC. Some enter the pathway, uh, as, our, as our library does, after Drosha. So we use RNA polymerase III to produce just this small hairpin. So we bypass Drosha processing, but still need Dicer processing to remove the loop and create the siRNA that goes into risk. And of course, you can use siRNAs directly, where you don't need the nucleus to do anything. You just deliver chemically synthesized small RNAs as a duplex, put them into cells, they get into risk, and you do your silencing. So, all three are completely valid ways of triggering RNAi. Uh, again, we prefer the shRNA. Uh, there's certainly evidence to support that the shRNA way of, of delivering them is, is the better way relative to the microRNA pathway. Uh, but other people would argue otherwise. And I'd, I'd actually argue that it really doesn't matter. Uh, you want to use the library that you have, or you want to use the library that you have access to, and the library that works. And, and our library certainly works quite well. Uh, so, so one yeah, more, Monica. More practical than the other. I mean, if yeah. you had all of them, would you choose one for practicality reasons? Yeah, so Monica asked, okay, so let's say you had all of them, how would you choose based on practicality? And we're going to discuss that specifically uh, in a little bit. Uh, if, if everything's an option, which would you choose? Uh, the, the pros and cons of each, absolutely. So siRNAs you can order from anywhere. Uh, it originally started, there was one company that, that had sort of figured out guys made a lot of money off of this, but in, before RNAi had been discovered, this small company had figured out how to synthesize RNA. And outside of a few RNA biologists, no one really, it's not that no one cared, it's just the, the market share for synthesizing RNA directly was pretty tiny. Uh, and then RNAi was discovered and some people made a lot of money <laughs> because they figured out a good way to synthesize siRNAs. Uh, but you can buy siRNAs from anywhere. This is just a, a screen capture of Google order siRNAs, and you can see 10 different companies pop up, uh, some of which are big players that you've certainly ordered stuff from before, Kyogen, Life Sciences, et cetera, and some other smaller companies. So getting siRNAs is very easy these days, and, and not, not cost prohibitive. Uh, so siRNA versus shRNA, what are some differences between them? You know, If you had to choose which one to screen, how would you choose? So first for delivery, so siRNA, as a, it's basically a small molecule, kind of a large small molecule, but you can think of it as a small molecule. It requires transfection. You've got to get it into the cell somehow. That's usually done by transfection. If you're working in tissue culture cells, you, you, know, you, you complex it with a lipid, put it into cells. So that, that's, that's how siRNAs get in there. They're small, so it's relatively easy to transfect. It's certainly true that if you're working with cells that you've had a hard time getting plasmid into them, you might be uh, able to do a much better job with siRNAs. Uh, just because they're smaller, you can use different lipid complex formation technologies. Uh, so siRNAs can be easier to transfect than plasmas. Not always. It's going to be very cell line dependent. Uh, and on some level, it's, uh, it's the paradox of excess, or whatever that phrase is. Right now, there are, you know, there's so many transfection reagents out there for siRNAs, it's how do you pick one, right? I mean, as many companies that sell siRNAs also each sell different lipid formulations for transfecting siRNAs, and where do you even start? Uh, you know, I think the first place you'd start is Google your cell line and siRNA transfection and look at the data, uh, because it, it is overwhelming, the, the amount of choice. shRNAs, uh, since they're, they're reliant on transcription, endogenous transcription in, in the cell of interest, uh, they all, on some level, start as a plasmid. Uh, but we use virus to deliver, so we'll package our plasmids into virus. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, but shRNA is now usually done with, with virus. Cost. Uh, siRNAs are non-renewable. You order a certain amount from a company, you put them into your cells, and 
you know, once you use it up, you got to reorder it. Uh, shRNA, once you have the plasmid, obviously you can just keep propagating the plasmid by yourself as much as you want. Uh, so, so shRNAs over the long run uh, can be more cost effective. Uh, in terms of the actual experiment, so siRNAs, once you put them into a cell, they start working, and then they, over time, stop working as the siRNA basically gets used up by the cell, as it dilutes out over time as the cell divides. So siRNAs are really only useful for short-term experiments. And again, that's, that's a whole universe of experiments, but short-term stuff. If you want long-term stable delivery, then you need to use an shRNA that integrates into the genome of your cell. Uh, we use lentivirus, as I'll get to in a minute, uh, that integrates stably. And you can also use controllable promoters. So just as you would for uh, expression of an ORF, you can use inducible or silenceable promoters uh, to turn your shRNA on or off as you want. Uh, finally, modifications. SIR, the field of siRNA synthesis has allowed, since it's being synthesized, a lot of chemical modifications. So there are ways of reducing off-target activities or enhancing stability. Uh, there's a lot of chemical modifications you can make to an siRNA since it's being synthesized that, for your particular application, might actually be quite useful. Uh, but obviously, that's not really feasible uh, with shRNAs that, that are start as DNA. OK, viral delivery. Again, there, there's a whole universe of viruses out there. Uh, what, are, what are your options, and what do we use here at the Broad? Uh, so retroviruses are, are one means of delivery. The genetic material of a retrovirus is RNA. You can package about eight kilobases worth of stuff into a retrovirus, uh, and it integrates into the chromosome. The kind of most commonly used retrovirus is MMLV. Uh, common about it only if infects dividing cells. So your cells have to be dividing in order to use a retrovirus. So neurons, for example, are not an appropriate cell choice for using a retrovirus. Uh, adenovirus is another class of virus. Uh, that's double-strand DNA is its genome. You can package a ton into it, but it doesn't integrate into the chromosome. So if you want long-term silencing, adenovirus is not where you want to be. You'd have to keep delivering it. Uh, but you can get extremely high titers with adeno. Production of adenovirus is uh, it's, it's certainly doable. It's hard to think about doing it in large scale because it is, it's, production of adenovirus takes a couple weeks. Uh, you can you kind of have to do successive Trans, uh, successive infections in order to get a really high titer. Uh, but if you're interested in you know, a small number of things, thinking about producing adeno is totally reasonable. Uh, and we've actually started playing around with adeno for some other reasons. Uh, AAV is another virus. AAV stands for adeno-associated virus. And it's adeno-associated virus only in the sense that they were physically discovered together. Uh, it was found that this virus often hung out with adenovirus in infecting cells, but from a Structural standpoint, they're, they're completely dissimilar. They just happen to, to go along together in nature. Uh, AAV uh, has a single-strand DNA genome. It's got a relatively small packaging capacity. Uh, but it's, some, it's a virus that, uh, especially the gene therapy community, has really uh, been attracted to lately. Because unlike any of these other viruses, it basically has very, very little immune stimulation. So the gene therapy people uh, are looking into using AAV. HSV, or herpes simplex virus, is another one. Kind of a niche use. Uh, making it's not terribly easy, but it is particularly good for neurons. So neurobiologists might have experience using uh, HSV. Uh, but finally, lentivirus. And that's the one that we use uh, for our library. Uh, lentivirus, uh, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a class of retrovirus, but it's usually discussed separately. Uh, lentivirus, HIV is the, the canonical lentivirus. The genetic material is RNA. You can package 8 KB, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, up to 10 KB, maybe, into a lentivirus. It integrates into the chromosome, and it can infect the vast majority of cell types. The cells don't need to be dividing to be infected with lentivirus. You can use it in vivo. Uh, we've certainly done experiments where people inject lentivirus into mouse brains and see good infection in the region of, it, of injection. Uh, it infects non-dividing cells. Uh, and again, we use our library is meant to be used as a lentivirus. Uh, any questions on any of that virus stuff? Yeah. Which part of the virus? So the, the lentivirus, I, actually, I should say a little bit more about this. Uh, so when you create lentivirus, uh, there are basically three parts you need, three packaging plasmids, one of which uh, is the part that will actually get made into virus. And then two of them are accessory or, or helper plasmids that make the other parts. Uh, and that's basically a biosafety concern, right? You would not want to have a lentivirus that was fully replicating and start making this stuff in the lab. Uh, 
I remember a friend of mine in the, in the very early days of RNA, I was like, I just made lentivirus that has a P53 targeting hairpin in it. I should be careful with that. <laughs> uh, so, you, you, you know, the, but, but then what, actually I have a slide in a minute that, that shows exactly what, what gets integrated uh, here. Uh, so this is what a lentiviral particle looks like. So you've got, uh, well, it doesn't really look like this. This is a cartoon. Uh, but lentivirus gets into the cell, and it brings with it two enzymes, reverse transcriptase and integrase, and then the viral RNA. Uh, this viral RNA uh, first gets uh, tr uh, reverse transcribed uh, into an RNA-DNA hybrid, uh, then makes it into double-strand double strand DNA, and that gets integrated into the host chromosome and gets transcribed or translated or, or whatever. Uh, so the way, the way ours is designed is that we have a, a, the, this part, the viral RNA, has a U6 promoter to drive transcription of the shRNA, and then a PGK promoter uh, that drives transcription, usually of, of pure mycin as a selection concept. Uh, so that, that's, that's how you trigger RNA. Now I want to get more specific, and that was relatively general. Now I want to get more specifically into what exists at the Broad for triggering RNA. What does our library look like? Uh, so the TRC3 library, so TRC stands for the RNAi consortium. I've never liked that the T stands for the, but what can you do? Uh, you need three letters to make an acronym, right? So TRC library, we're now on version three. Uh, meaning how often this group of people come together to decide we're going to do. Dave, you want to comment on that at all? You've, you've been around for the, the whole time. How, how the TRC came into existence and what it is? Yeah, so uh, right or not long after 2001, when, as John was telling you, uh, all of this was discovered, the RNA interference in general, and then soon thereafter the ability to introduce it to mammalian cells. Um, there were a few investigators in this area who were anxious to build libraries and start using it for, uh, for genetics. And um, those, some of the uh, founders of the RNAi Consortium are uh, Nir Cohen and David Sabatini and uh, Brent Stockwell. Uh, Bill Hahn joined that effort and uh, Sheila Stewart. Uh, they were um, both uh, Weinberg Lab folks. Um, and it, over a year or two period, these guys thought about all kinds of ways to uh, put together an effort to build big genome scale libraries. And uh, the RNAi Consortium grew out of that about the time that we went and talked to Eric Lander. Uh, he had a really good idea about how to build it into a big consortium and make a big library, as, as anybody who knows Eric can well imagine. Uh, so that in 2004, we launched the RNAi Consortium, and it's been going ever since, building yep. libraries and, and uh, other tools for. Yeah. And I should point out, it, it's, a, it's a consortium that includes both academics and industry as well. So we've had many different uh, industry partners as well over, over time. Uh, so well, what is the library as it stands today? Well, we target basically the entire human and mouse genome. So we have both a human version and a mouse version. Uh, we've got just under 300,000 shRNA constructs. And you'll see what that physically looks like in a little bit. Uh, the library is redundant in that we have multiple shRNAs that target the same gene, and we'll talk a lot about why that is uh, in a little bit. Uh, information, you know, how do you, and Dave already mentioned this website, but if you want to start getting your hands on these things and learning a, a lot of this stuff and actually even get a lot of the information that's on these slides, go to the Broad Community TRC portal. So the full info, you know, everything that we have is available on the intranet, uh, which is the IWW. Broad site. And for that, to log in, all you need is a Broad email address. Uh, we also have a public site that has more limited information, uh, but you don't need to log in. And it still has plenty of stuff. So if you, if you don't yet have a Broad appointment and you want to be able to access this stuff, the public site is certainly a good place to get started. Uh, but to get everything you need, the Broad. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, uh, about pools and what's available. I'm right about to get to that. Great. Uh, so on the website, you can search for your favorite gene of interest. Uh, you, you can search by gene, search by clone. You type it in. One thing that often trips people up is that official gene symbols are case sensitive. Uh, human genes are all caps. Mouse genes, the first letter is capitalized, and the rest is lowercase. Uh, so make sure you know which one you're searching for. Uh, and we say that here, but no one ever reads that. <laughs> 
Uh, so gene symbols case sensitive. You can search for your gene when you do that. So type in a gene, search for it. Uh, you then get what we have for this gene. So I typed in the gene MITF. Uh, you find it, get, it was found. You get a description of the gene. It's gene symbol. It's gene ID. I just want to say, so gene ID uh, is not something that people are necessarily used to working with, but it's actually, uh, in my opinion at least, the best identifier for a gene. The gene symbol can vary over time, and if you read the literature, you'll often see that the same gene you know, has had six different names during its lifetime. Uh, the gene ID uh, is an official NCBI designation for a gene. Uh, so it, it's usually the best way if you're curating lists or coming up with what you want to target. Uh, the, the gene ID, that, that number, is very useful. And it's also uh, completely non-redundant. So MITF in mouse and MITF in human, they have the same gene symbol outside of the capitalization, but they have different gene ID numbers. So it, it's a very useful way to make sure you don't switch things like that. But anyway, so you type in a gene. You get, OK, here's the gene. Here are all the different transcripts in NCBI for that gene. Uh, you can then click on either the gene ID, or, or actually, you can click on show all clones for these genes and see, well, what do we have for this gene? Uh, and you'll see for MITF, we have 10 different hairpins targeting MITF. Uh, and again, this is all on the website. You'll get where it matches, if it targets the coding sequence or the 3' UTR. Uh, we have knockdown data. So we did qPCR, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, but if we've determined the knockdown efficiency of these hairpins in a model cell line, that data is on the website. Uh, so you can get all that information. Uh, just a description of the features, because I know that previous slide is a little hard to read. So the clone ID, which is the TRCN and then 10 digits, that is a physical entity. So to us, a clone ID means a physical entity with a freezer location, a rack location, a well location. It's a thing in a tube. Uh, and the reason I mention that is that one you know, I call it a gremlin uh, that I wouldn't want to trip you up, is that the same 21 mer, so the same thing that'll, the, the same biological entity, once you put it into a cell, the same 21 mer can have different TRCN IDs. So we could have made the same 21 mer twice. Uh, we could have put it into a different vector. Uh, for example, we have two vectors, the original PLKO.1, and then a second version, PLKO TRC005. Uh, they are very similar in sequence and performance. Uh, really, the only difference is that TRC005, we added the WPRE, the Woodchuck Post-Transcriptional Response Element, uh, which has been purported to help improve lentivirus titer. You haven't really seen that it helps all that much. Uh, and then there are some, we you know, just engineered in a few more restrict, uh, useful restriction sites into TRC005. Uh, but especially since later on, having two hairpins give you the same phenotype is a very important measure for if you're having an on-target effect or an off-target effect. Uh, just know that you can have two different TRCNs, but they have the exact same sequence. Again, it's not pervasive in the library, but you want to know that that exists. Uh, likewise, on the previous slide, there was a mention of intrinsic and adjusted scores. Those are computational predictors of activity, uh, but anyone who claims that they can you can give them a sequence of an siRNA or an shRNA, and they'll be able to predict knockdown. They're uh, not telling the truth fully. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's, you can't just make a perfect siRNA every single time. Uh, there are certainly rules, and we use these rules, uh, but they're not perfect predictors. So the computational score predicts a little bit, but you wouldn't want to hang your hat on it. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we also have, if we were able to determine the knockdown efficiency, that's on the website, too. So protocols, a lot of protocols on the website. And you know, uh, uh, we recently updated them. Uh, but to be honest, that was just basically fixing typos and adding a few sentences. A lot of these protocols have existed more or less unchanged for almost 10 years now. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, usually when you're looking at anything on the internet, right? if you see a date that's old, you're like, oh, I don't want to click on that. Or, oh, that's an old paper. I don't want to read that. Uh, with a protocol, you kind of want it to be the same for a long, long time. And again, many of these. Uh, we recently updated the formatting, but uh, we've been using the same thing for a long time. So if you want to know how to clone hairpins, or do lentiviral infections, or titer your virus, or produce virus, a lot of protocols are on the website that you should uh, feel free to, to use. And uh, I'll, I'll just interject here that some of these protocols, for example, doing plasma DNA preps of the PLKO vectors, or doing virus production, uh, we uh, sunk quite a lot of time into optimizing those. So uh, some of them have been more or less unchanged for a number of years now, but often there were maybe uh, a year and a half's worth of 
um, testing to get those protocols very optimized. Um, so it's worth your while. You, you will find lentiviral production protocols all over the place. And of course, there's a zillion protocols for prepping plasma DNA, but uh, they don't all work equally well. And, and uh, it's worth using these to, to work on the PLKO vectors and package them. That's right. That's right. Uh, so yeah, a lot of protocols on the website. If you want to order reagents, you can do that through our website. So you can order shRNA and ORFs. You can order TAILS. Uh, the Target Accelerator uh, Initiative has uh, uh, it's much more recent, but it's the idea of, of making more custom reagents. Uh, now, it, it practically, usually the rate limiting step for actually getting reagents in your hand is getting your PI to fund the quote. Uh, so make sure you talk to your PI in advance of emailing us and saying, where's my virus, where's my virus? Because it's often your PI hasn't paid for it yet. Uh, I should point out that all platforms at the Broad, not just the RNAi, we work on a cost recovery mechanism. So what that basically means is when you order virus or a streak of bacteria or whatever, uh, your lab pays for the incremental cost of doing that. Uh, obviously, I get paid, Dave gets paid, we have technicians, 35 people need to be paid somehow. Uh, and the model is that the, the labs play the incremental cost recovery of, of getting reagents. Uh, so make sure you talk to your PI first before requesting stuff. Uh, we have a lot of vectors. So you know the, the, the library itself is in a single vector, TRC uh, LKO.1 and, and the, the .5 version. But we have a lot of alternative vectors that one might use based on the experiment you want to do. Uh, so we have our constitutive shRNA vectors. And again, the standard one has pyramycin resistance. But we have a version that's blastocidin resistant, or hygro resistant, or neo resistant. We have some that have GFP on them. We have some that have both GFP and pyramycin. So we have a lot of alternative vectors that might better suit what you want to do. Uh, now, again, we do not have all 300,000 hairpins in those vectors. That would be a bit silly. Uh, but we certainly have a lot of vectors that if you're particularly interested in starting an experiment or what's standardly available doesn't work, we have a lot of vectors that you can clone your hairpin into. Uh, and, and work with it that way. Likewise, we have vectors that allow you to induce shRNA expression. Uh, there's kind of two ways of inducing. There's the more standard doxycycline-based way using the TET repressor. But we also have a LAC uh, means of inducing, where you add IPTG, and that causes the LAC inhibitor to bind or, or excuse me, to fall off, uh, which again have a variety of selection markers. We're going to talk in a little bit about ORF vectors, but again, our library is in some standard vectors. But then there are a lot of alternative vectors that have different promoters for driving your ORF, different selection markers, uh, presence of GB GFP if you want a visual marker. So there's a lot of variety there that we have. So even if we don't have that reagent uh, for your gene pre-existing, there are a lot of vectors that you can put your reagents into uh, for your exact experiment. Uh, Pre-made screening set. So that's that's starting to get at your question. So you know, as far as I'm aware, no one's ever screened all 300,000 of our shRNAs. That's not particularly feasible. There's a lot of times where you would want to start with a more focused set. Okay. So when we do arrayed screens, and by arrayed I just mean you know 96 or 384 well plates, one perturbation per well, you do a screen that way. So very similar to small molecule screening. Uh, we have a bunch of pre-made sets, so targeting all the kinases, you know, that's a class of proteins. Targeting all the phosphatases, another class. Uh, transcription factors, chromatin factors, uh, et cetera. Uh, usually for both human and mouse, but some are, are, are just for human. So those are pre-made, we call them focused sets. So if you have a question that you thought, eh, I think that, you know, I'm particularly interested in how, you know, I'm particularly interested in mitochondrial phenotypes. You don't want to screen the whole human genome. You want to screen just the things that have been nominated somehow or another as being involved in the mitochondria. So we have pre-made screening sets. Uh, we also have pre-made pools. Uh, so the original pooled, mal uh, pooled human genome, uh, pooled human genome library, uh, had about 54,000 hairpins in it. Uh, but we've since upgraded as we've made more hairpins. Uh, to now our human screening set has 98,000 hairpins in it. Likewise, we have a mouse genome-wide pool that has uh, about 17, it covers about 17,000 genes and has 92,000 hairpins in it. Uh, so we have these pre-made pools ready to screen, uh, at least in human space. We also have three other pre-made pools targeting kinases, phosphatases, and an epigenetic pool that has proven popular lately. Uh, so if you wanted to, you know, especially the, the smaller sets, if you don't know yet if you want to do a genome-wide screen, or again, you, you're specifically interested in a set, it allows you to do more screening at less cost, because you don't need as many cells, you don't need as many sequencing reads, 
et cetera, et cetera. So we do have some pre-made pools. Custom pools, though, uh, that, that's another, that's a, for some experimental setting, the ability to take, to cherry pick from our 300,000 shRNAs and only take the ones you want. You know, the 5Q syndrome that Dave started off in the beginning, there was no reason that we would have had pre-made, you know, all 40 genes in the 5Q region. But we can just rearray, and we'll show you a video of that in a little bit. We can rearray just the shRNAs that you want, and you can make a custom set of whatever genes you want. It could be, you know, you, you've nominated 50 genes from a GWAS study as, okay, these are the 50 genes that I want to study, because GWAS says these are important. You can array just those 50 genes. Or from a cancer, uh, cancer genome sequencing, okay, here are the 50 mutations that are relevant in GBM. I want to see what knockdown or overexpression of those 50 genes does. So you can array your custom set. Uh, and you can have it either as arrayed virus or as pooled virus. Uh, so the ability to, to make your set, and again, screen in a much more focused way, can be quite valuable, especially, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of biology now is lists, right? You have a list of genes, and we're going to talk a lot more about when you do a screen, you get a list of genes. But a lot of people come in with a list of genes, and they want to screen just the genes on that list. So we, we absolutely support that, uh, and that, that's a very useful way of doing screening cost-effectively. Uh, so performance of the library. So I mentioned I'd get to this. So we did a very large effort of looking at the qPCR performance of you know, how well do our hairpins knock down their intended target. Uh, now, obviously, we couldn't do this for every single gene because we picked a couple of cell lines, cell lines that were easy to work with, easy to infect, easy, uh, easy to get good RNA from. Uh, so if a gene wasn't expressed in one of the workhorse cell lines that we were using, we couldn't determine if it was knocked down or not. But we have knockdown data on about half of our collection. Uh, so we have a good sense of, of overall performance uh, characteristics of our library. Uh, and here, here are two important points. First, our qPCR data is quite reproducible. So here's just replicate experiments. Replicate one, replicate two. And we ask, where did the five hairpins targeting a gene rank in experiment one to experiment two? Was the best hairpin in experiment one also the best hairpin in experiment two in terms of performance? And you can see that you know, by the size of these bubbles, yes, they were. So the, ranking, the, the relative performance from experiment to experiment of your hairpins generally doesn't change. So that's good. That just means technically we were measuring knockdown well. But the more important point is shown on the right, where now it's not replicates, but cell line one and cell line two. And there you see it looks almost identical to the technical replicates. So the conclusion from that is a hairpin that works very well in one cell line is quite likely to work very well in another cell line. Or more importantly, our qPCR data that's on the website, determined in A549 cells or 293 cells, is likely to be quite predictive for the performance of that hairpin in your cell line. You know, the best hairpin in our set, in our cell lines, is likely to be the best hairpin in your set, in your cell lines. Uh, so that's very useful. There, there's some prediction to that. Uh, that, that, you know, again, we, if we had found that this did not hold, we would not have determined the qPCR knockdown in A549 for 150,000 hairpins. That would not have been very effective. Yeah? The infection efficiency for both is the same. What is it? It's like MY, you know, one. Oh, OK. So a question on infection efficiency. So I'm going to talk about that in two slides, OK? Uh, in terms of uh, how well we, oh, yeah. No, so this is this is this is qPCR. So this is qPCR. Yes, absolutely. So cyber green based qPCR of the endogenous messenger RNA. Because you said we do it right is by you know having a yeah report it. We those reporter assays aren't terribly predictive. I mean they're they're not non predictive, but they're not perfectly predictive either. Uh, whereas the qPCR, I mean the qPCR is the knockdown. And I should also add, I, I didn't point it out. But if, you know, because we did 150,000 qPCR experiments, we also have 150,000 validated primer pairs to do qPCR for your gene of interest. So when you search for a gene, one thing that comes up are, if we did qPCR, what primers we used and if it worked or not. So you can definitely, you know, that's just another resource that came out of doing this. Dave, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, just that, so that the numbers of genes might be useful here that we validated knockdown for. We validated um, the knock down um, performance of about 120,000 hairpins, and they target about 9,000 human genes and 9,000 mouse genes. So about half the genome 
in each case. So we have those 18,000, I guess, uh, uh, some odd uh, primer pairs uh, that have some evidence about how well they work, and those could be useful for you as well. Yeah. Uh, so getting to the question, though, of, OK, so that, that's how the hairpins work relative to each other. But how about on the level of, of gene? Uh, what, what's the distribution look like? So on, on the left, you can see a histogram of what fraction of our libraries uh, been by the percent knockdown. So you can see that you know, 22,000 of our hairpins uh, out of the 118,000 that we got data for for this chart uh, give 90% to 100% knockdown. Uh, and not, not too many give no knockdown. Uh, so just as a, as a uh, somewhat arbitrarily chosen threshold of what's a good hairpin? And we get that question a lot. Well, what's good? Uh, we choose 70% knockdown as good. Did we? Is there any particular reason to choose 70%? Why not 75? Why not 60? Why not 80? I don't know. I mean, you know, you, you got to draw a threshold somewhere. Those that are less than 70. No, I mean, the ones that are less than 70, uh, you know, especially when we do pools, that, those are in there, and they can still be quite valuable. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah I, I'll make one comment on that. As Monica's question suggests, to get a phenotype, you might only need 30% knockdown. You might need 95. You don't know how much you need for any particular experiment you want to do. There is one reason to pick something around 70%, and it's entirely a technical issue around the qPCR experiment, that that's where the confidence starts getting really high that you really do have knockdown. That is, if you, if you measure better than 70% knockdown, the chance that that's completely false, just a, you know, very great overestimate and it really didn't knock down, the chance of that's very small. So the stuff that's over 70% does knock down might not be the number you got precisely. The stuff below 70% confidence isn't so good, it might knock down twofold, maybe less. So when you start speaking about your binary of the old answer, you, know, you get at least uh, at the bottom, I've noticed that sometimes there's some that are greater than 100 percent Sure. So the question is, when you search that list and you look at knockdown, how can the value be a greater than 100%, which you sometimes see? Yeah. Uh, so there's two explanations for that. F first is technical, right? If you get 200% knockdown, which doesn't make any sense, right? That, that's you're increasing the expression. You know, going from 100% to 200%, that's one qPCR cycle, right? So it, what does it mean to be different from less than one qPCR? qPCR cycle, if you think about what, what PCR is actually measuring. So there's certainly noise in that region. But that said, we have seen some genes where whenever you attempt to knock them down, you end up detecting more RNA than you started with. But that's biology, right? In the sense that you can certainly imagine that the cell is detecting, geez, this gene has been knocked down. I need more of it. And they just dramatically upregulate its transcription. We've never followed up on that, but it, it's certainly something we've seen and is completely reasonable uh, that there's just a feed forward mechanism to increase the transcription of a gene that you need. It could be off target, but I don't, not if there are like five hairpins that all, absolutely. So the things that make it have been validated in the same way, five replicates instead of isolation. Yeah. And, uh, and just, just to clarify one thing there, we, we, our data will never have more than 100% knocked down. Um, but it, the, usually we, we cite the data in terms of the percentage percent of the expression remaining. that's remaining compared to the untreated cells or the control treated cells. So you can have 200%, meaning you got more after the, more of your target after the tr knockdown, supposed knockdown than before. Yeah. So. Um, but one more question you, you, about just overall performance of the library. You know, how many hairpins do we have that knock down their target gene well? Again, using that 70% cutoff as good knockdown. For 88% of genes that have exactly five hairpins, 88% of genes, we have at least one hairpin that knocks down 70% or better. And 77% of genes, we have at least two hairpins. So odds are pretty good that for your gene of interest, we will have at least one or two shRNAs that are validated to knock down good, uh, again, based on that threshold. OK, so a question about titer, because we get questions on titer a lot. And, and it, Titer does seem to confuse a lot of people. So I want to go through very quickly, well, not quickly, very carefully what titer is. So viral titer. Titer attempts to answer the question of how many infectious particles there are per unit of volume. So historically, this was done with bacteriophages on a lawn of bacteria. So you have a lawn of E. coli. You dump your bacteriophage on it. And then you count plaques. You count holes where there are no more bacteria. So that's the plaque-forming units per mil. And this is stuff that like 
Delbruck and Luria did in the, in the 30s and 40s. Okay, that's, that's tighter. But with lentiviruses on mammalian, on cultured mammalian cells, uh, what you care about is it's usually expressed as viral particles per mil. How many lenti lentiviruses are there in a mil of virus? Okay. Determining the titer, you know, you can't get in and count the particles. You have to do a functional assay. And determining the titer is very, very dependent on experimental conditions. Likewise, multiplicity of infection, or MOI, that's basically viral particles divided by the number of cells. Okay? But since the number of viral particles is dependent on experimental conditions, so is the MOI, or your determination of the number of viral particles is dependent on experimental conditions, so is the MOI. And let me give you an explicit example of that. So here's a tube of virus. Okay? You take a small volume of it and put it onto a plate of cells. You then add your selection reagent. In our case, it would be pyromycin, for example. Wait a while for the uninfected cells to die. And the infected cells, because they now have pyromycin resistance, they'll grow out and they'll grow a colony. And you can stain it with any dye you want. And you can count how many colonies there are. This is sort of classical virus titering. OK, so if you get 20 colonies, and you want to know the, the titer, you get 20 colonies, divide by the volume, uh, multiply because you were in microliters. You want to express it in colonies per mil. And you determine that, OK, this tube of virus has 4 times 10 to the fifth infectious particles per mil. So aha, you've determined the titer. OK, but then you do it. You talk to your PI and says, oh, uh, now I want to know on a different cell. And I don't care its infectability in HeLa cells. We're working in 293T cells. So do the experiment again on 293T cells. So you do it on 293T cells, which infect better. And now you get 400 colonies. So now you do the same math, and you say, oh, well, now my titer is 8 times 10 to the sixth infectious particles per mil from the same tube, because you switched cell lines. And you go back to your PI, and he says, oh, that's still not good enough. Uh, hey, did you add polybrine to the cells when you did this? And did you centrifuge when you did this? And you say, oh, no, I didn't, need to, I didn't know I needed to do that. So now you add polybrine at the time of infection and centrifuge the cells. And now you get 10,000 colonies. And you say, aha, now my titer is 2 times 10 to the eighth infectious particles per mil. So all of these are the titer. But they are incredibly dependent on experimental conditions. Okay? So when people claim, OK, this is the titer, or you know, it's this great number, it's this crappy number, it really does depend on the experimental conditions. It's not an absolute measure, no matter what people tell you uh, or what people are trying to sell you. Uh, there are other ways of determining titer. P24 ELISA is a standard one that's sold. In our experience, it's not a very reliable means of determining titer. And especially since it's expensive, it's generally not a good way to spend your money. Uh, you want to do a functional assay in the cells that you're actually going to do your experiment in. Uh, just a quick word on, on MOI, because it does affect your experimental conditions. So the multiplicity of infection is a function of the Poisson distribution. And I won't even show the equation. Uh, but again, MOI is a function of viral titer. And since viral titer depends on experimental conditions, your MOI depends on experimental conditions. Uh, and you know, if, if you infect at an MOI of 0.5, okay, so once you've determined your functional titer in your cells of interest, and then take that titer, divide by the number of cells, and say an MOI of 0.5, what that means is that 60% of your cells will have no virus on them, will not be infected. 30% will have one viral particle. 8% will have two viral particles, et cetera. Okay? If you infect at an MOI of 5, now this whole curve shifts. And only 1% of your cells are uninfected. And the average is centered right around 5. So, MO, MOI uh, can matter a lot for your experimental conditions. In an arrayed screen, for example, where you don't want to have lots of your cells with no virus, okay, you would want to infect at a higher MOI. For a pooled screen, where you only want cells to get one viral particle, not to have many different shRNAs in your cells, you want to infect at a low MOI. Now, I should point out, and I, I made a note to myself to include this slide, but I did not. Uh, I should point out that we have looked at the function of, our, of how good our knockdown is as a function of MOI. And we don't see much difference at all. So we do see a slight increase in the amount of knockdown as we increase MOI, but not much at all. So what that functionally means is that our pooled screens that have one viral integrant per cell, you're getting just as basically as much knockdown as you're going to get as if you had 
five viral particles. Not much. It, it, you do get a little bit of an increase with higher MOI, but you do not see anything remote, uh, approaching a dose-specific response. You cannot sort of tighter in your knockdown by tightering in more and more virus. Okay, Nikita. Yeah, so Pekita's question was, how many genes have we tested this in? And the, the data I've seen, it, it was a couple hundred hairpins, uh, at least. Dave, you're more familiar with those data. Let me get my microphone on. Yeah, um, we, we did test that on a couple of dozen genes with a small number of hairpins each. We tested it on a very large number of hairpins just for a, a reporter uh, for GFP, uh, I think is where we tested a lot of hairpins. Uh, just a little more detail on that. For arrayed screens, we often do use an MOI well above one, like an average of five infections. We do it partly just to get that little extra bit of knockdown, because if it doesn't cost you anything, why not? The amount of remaining protein usually goes down by about 10%. So that's a little bit more knockdown, not a lot. Um, but also, the amount of titer that you have well to well for each of your different reagents varies quite a bit. So if you use more titer, those poor titer wells, the viruses that weren't as abundant, are now going to infect okay. Um, so for rate screens, we tend to use an MOI of five, even though we don't really need it for knockdown per se, just for consistency. If you go high, you know, you still have really get like only under 70%. If, if yeah, so, use, so the question is viability effects. And this is something about hairpins. I've noticed this myself many times. If you take a lentivirus that contains a hairpin and compare it to a lentivirus that does not contain a hairpin, the lentivirus with a hairpin gets toxic at higher MOIs a lot faster than a hairpin that doesn't have a hair, or the, the virus that doesn't have a hairpin in it. I, I don't know for a fact, but it's likely to be that if you put in a ton of virus with a hairpin in it, you start to screw up the endogenous microRNA processing. So that makes sense. But I mean, that's at an MOI of 50 or 100 that you would never want to screen at anyway. Uh, you know, once you get up to an MOI of 5 to 10, you don't really ever need to go higher. So you would want to stop there. Uh, and if you do go much higher, you will, you will see toxicity. OK, uh, so that was RNAi reagents. But we do have other reagents in the platform, uh, such as our ORF library, our open reading frame library. Uh, just a, a word on gateway cloning, since our ORF library is completely gateway compatible. So how does gateway cloning work? Well, first, it's, it's, uh, the enzymes needed to do this are sold by Life Technologies, the company that was formerly known as Invitrogen. And it's a recombination-based transfer of cassettes. So you start with an entry clone. Okay? And an entry clone has your gene of interest in it. And you then take a destination vector. You do an LR reaction, and that gives you your expression clone. Okay? Uh, you can also do it in reverse, or you can make your entry clone by taking a PCR product and a donor clone and doing a BP reaction. Okay? So this is all a means of shuttling about DNA in a recombinational way. So you can basically, the, the, the reason to do it is that if you try to do this by restriction enzymes and build a big library, well, of course, some of your genes, whatever restriction enzyme you choose, some of your genes are going to have them in the middle of it. So you wouldn't want to you know, do this by digest. Doing it recombinationally, you can shuttle things about in a sequence-independent way that, that's very convenient. Uh, so all of our ORF library is gateway compatible. Uh, again, this is uh, just the, the growth conditions of how, of depending on which clone you're using, what, you, what uh, growth conditions you would want. Uh, I should note that our, our entry clones and our donor clones, uh, there are two flavors, one of which is canamycin resistant, one of which is spectinomycin resistant. Uh, if you're working with either a donor vector or a destination vector, they have the CCDB death cassette in them. This is very important for the gateway cloning and making sure you select for what you want and to get what you don't. But if you are growing up a CCDB containing plasmid, you need to do it in specialized E. coli that you can buy from Life Technologies that are resistant to this death cassette. If you transform one of these plasmids into top 10 cells or DH5 alpha, you won't get anything. Uh, likewise, we found that when you have this cassette around, it's far better to grow your bacteria at 30 degrees than at 37, especially when they're in liquid culture. Uh, but our ORF library. So right now, we have about 16,000 clones covering about almost 14,000 genes. Uh, we fully sequence uh, about 13,000 of the genes. Uh, the rest of the guys have partial sequence read for most of them. And there are about 10,000 genes 
that are fully coding transcripts with greater than 99% match to NCBI RefSeq. So the, the size of the library varies a little bit based on what you call a clone or not, uh, but we cover about 10,000 genes very, very well. Uh, the library right now is in two different vectors. Uh, the first vector, PLEX 304, and a newer vector that we're almost done transferring everything into, PLEX 307. Uh, they're both lentivirus vectors, just like with our SHRNA library. Uh, some features of them. So PLEX 304, the promoter driving expression of the ORF is CMV. CMV promoter is very strong in some cell lines, but it's also silenced in some cell types, specifically uh, many cell types, but including ES cells. Uh, so CMV is, is a good choice for some cell lines, but not for others. The newer vector, 307, uses the EF1 alpha promoter. That's an endogenous human promoter uh, that gives strong expression in, in almost every cell line and more consistent. It's not silenced nearly as much as often as, as CMV is. In fact, I don't know of any cell line where EF1 alpha doesn't express. Uh, both of these vectors have a V5 tag at the C terminus. So if your ORF is open, meaning that when you cloned it, you did not include its endogenous stop codon, so when you put it into a vector, translation will continue past the C terminus of the vector, uh, our vectors will add a V5 tag onto the C terminus of it. Obviously, if you included the stop codon in your vector, then you will not get the V5 tag on it. But that can be, we've used the V5 tag a lot to determine expression. You can certainly use it for pull-down experiments, et cetera. Uh, PLEX304 uses blastocytin as the selective reagent. PLEX307 uses pyromycin as the selective reagent. Uh, and likewise, the PLEX304 vector did not have a barcode in it, so there was no easy means of pooling different clones and doing a pooled experiment, but the PLEX307 does have a unique barcode in it so that you can pool together a bunch of ORFs and do a pooled screen and, 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 and then sequence your readout to see which ones came out at the end. Uh, again, the, the PLEX307 vector is not, uh, the vector's available, the clones uh, are not fully available yet, but they should be in a couple, week, a couple months, I'd say. Uh, by early to mid-summer, uh, that will be available. Uh, th these are data showing, again, this difference in expression. So on the, uh, this is, each line is a collection of ORFs put into four different cell lines. So red is 293T, green is A375, blue is A549, and purple is HEPA, so sort of four workhorse cell lines. Uh, and this is just a histogram of the amount of expression you get off the ORF uh, determined with that V5 tag at the C terminus. And you can see the PLEX307 vector that has the EF1 alpha promoter, uh, the distribution is very similar across the four cell lines. Whereas the CMV promoter, there are two cell lines, uh, 293T and A375, that express to really high levels, but two cell lines where you get less expression. Now, less expression is not no expression, but we do obviously see more variance in the amount of expression you get across cell lines with the, with the different phonorus. Monica? Yes, so Monica's asking, do we have inducible vectors for ORFs? And yes, we do, actually. Uh, so we, we have, again, it, it's a vector that we have not put the whole library into. But if you are interested in a particular gene, we do have a very nice inducible vector that you can gateway transfer your clones into, and then by adding different levels of doxycycline, get different levels of expression. And it works quite well. Do you have plans to get the whole library in that kind of format? Do you have money to put the whole library in that type of format? Yeah, uh, no, but that if we were to do a third vector for the ORF library, it's almost certain that we would want it to be inducible because that does cover a lot of experimental territory. Dave? Yeah, um, that's come up. We likely will do it sooner or later for some application or another. Um, it might seem like you would very much want that for a screening application at, on the surface, but if you think about it a little bit more, maybe not, um, simply because you don't know the level that you want to express every single gene in the library at. Um, you, it, so you, you know, picking some level is going to be right for some genes and not for others. So it's it's really more useful for one region at a time. But it's more of having the ability to cipher it to whatever level you want to downstream. Yeah, right. it lets you um, fiddle with the timing of your experiment a lot more, and that's that's what's going to draw us to do that eventually. Yeah. I think. But no, it's definitely a, again, you can do it now for particular genes of interest that you transfer yourself, but getting the whole library in there is something that will probably eventually happen, yeah. Uh, I should also point out that, that similar to the way that knockdown uh, sort of correlates well across cell lines, ORF expression level correlates quite well across cell lines. Uh, so all of these are just comparisons of uh, each dot 
is an ORF in one cell line versus the other. And you can see that, especially for the EF1 alpha, you know, they all kind of fall nicely on, on the XY line. So there's good correlation across them. So with yeah. the PLX3 and 7, then, do you have hundreds of, I mean, like, uh, if you took a bar trade, right? Hmm. So then you would, uh, if you wanted to request that, you would just ask for like 10 different 307s? Oh, so, so the question is, when, when the 307 is available and it's barcoded, how do you request it? Uh, so each ORF is already in a uniquely barcoded vector. So if you get the ORF for MITF, you would also get with it, these are the 24 nucleotides in its barcode. A different ORF has a different barcode, et cetera. So it's already pre-baked in there. It's not like you need to get first the set of barcodes and then the entry clones and do the LR yourself. We, we did all that, yeah. OK, so then the question is, for genes that aren't in the ORF collection, do we have uh, unused barcodes uh, that you could put your gene into? Uh, I don't think we have that. We could fairly easily generate that. We also have a version of 307 that just doesn't have the barcode in it, uh, that if you're just doing one gene at a time and there's no need for the barcode. I mean, the barcode's just a 24 nucleotide stretch of DNA that, that sits in a relatively irrelevant place. So you could, you could certainly do that. Uh, but, but as for the expression, now th this is totally understandable, and it's not a function of titer either. We, we've definitely looked at this. I mean, what this basically says is that different proteins have different half-lives, which we already knew, right? I mean, some proteins, you know, presumably the level of transcription of all these guys is more or less the same because they all have the same promoter, but then they have different half-lives. So the amount of stable protein you detect three days after infection is going to vary because they all have different half-lives. Uh, so totally, totally uh, expected. Uh, and again, as, I, as I, I've showed this slide before, but we have a lot of alternative vectors. So we have an inducible ORF vector. We have uh, different promoters, different uh, selectable markers, et cetera, uh, for you to use for your particular gene of interest. OK, final thing I want to talk about are tail reagents in the platform. Uh, so tails are a programmable modular DNA binding domain that were uh, discovered a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the crystal structure of a tail binding to DNA. Uh, each of these is a repeating monomer, so finger one, finger two, finger three, uh, that contact the DNA where two of the amino acids out of the 34 dictate what DNA sequence you bind to. So based on the identity of those two amino acids, you can build a DNA binding protein that binds to whatever DNA sequence you want. Uh, and you can do that for a bunch of different things. You could put a transcriptional activator at the end of that and create your own transcription factor. You could put a transcriptional repressor to that DNA binding domain and create a transcriptional repressor. Uh, but one main use, uh, and so this would certainly complement our existing tools. You can imagine that transcriptional activation in our ORF library are nice ways to validate each other. Transcriptional repression and shRNAs are a nice way to validate each other. Uh, but one, one main use has been to create permanent genetic changes. So instead of putting a transcriptional activator repressor, you put a nuclease at the end of your tail. And and this was done many years ago with zinc fingers as the means of binding to DNA, but now you can do it with just a different DNA binding domain. So you put the FOC1 nuclease at the end of your tail, and if you have two tails that allows FOC1 to dimerize, you generate a double-strand DNA break in your DNA. Now, there are two things that can happen if you generate a double-strand DNA break in DNA. One is that if you do nothing, non-homologous end joining will create loss of function mutants. Because non-homologous end joining is sloppy, uh, you'll get indel. So if you were to create a, a double-strand DNA break in, say, the first exon of your gene, you'll then get frame shifts, and you won't get any expression of your gene anymore. Okay? You'll create a premature stop coda. So people have done this. Uh, here's a paper from NGH uh, where they targeted 96 different human genes uh, to create loss of function alleles. And you can see the efficiency uh, can get as high as 50% of all the alleles in the, in the pool of cells uh, were modified. Uh, but you can also, and again, this is something the mouse community has been doing for years, uh, when you make knockout and knock-in mice, you can use homologous recombination with a provided template and insert DNA of interest into your cells, and you can, or at a specific place into your cells. Now, why would you want to do that? You might want to do that to introduce a small variant. Let's say you want to study a GWAS hit, and you want to say, okay, well, how does, how does this single nucleotide change affect diabetes in my cell model of diabetes? So you introduce that small variant. You could think about tagging an endogenous protein. So there are a lot of genes, you know, ChIP-seq. People love to do ChIP-seq. You're very limited by having an antibody against your gene of interest. Uh, if you don't have the antibody, then you need to overexpress the gene. But that can be problematic if the clone for your gene does not exist, uh, or it's a very big gene that you think you might never be able to clone, like the MLLs. 
Uh, so you could certainly think about tagging your protein endogenously. And now you've got a good antibody, you use the flag tag or V5 tag or whatever, to pull down on the endogenous gene. And importantly, it's expressed at the right levels, it's spliced at the right levels, all that stuff. Uh, you could create reporter genes that, that maintain endogenous control, et cetera. So there's a lot of things you can do uh, by engineering cells to, to do what you want. Uh, here's an example from Alex Meissner's lab. Uh, so in the endogenous gene of interest, uh, she, uh, Christina removed the stop codon, put in a 2A GFP cassette, and now her ES cells fluoresce green when that endogenous gene of interest was on. So now she has a reporter for this gene. And in her experiment, uh, she picked 60 clones that were GFP positive at the end of electroparating in the DNA and the homologous repair arm. She got 60 clones, 58 of them that were GFP positive had monoallelic integration, meaning it integrated into one allele, but two of them actually went into both alleles from one round of targeting. Uh, so it can be quite an efficient process. Uh, I'm going to skip this part on repair templates. We've done it, but I will say that we've done, we've started to do a lot of work on building generally useful repair templates because a lot of people want to do the same general things. They want to tag a protein, they want to create a reporter gene, they want to do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, so we've started to build up some vectors that will just be general purpose uh, repair templates where all you really need to do is put in your homology arms of interest for your gene of interest in the right place, uh, but the vector's pre-built. So I've had a lot of conversations with people, well, okay, I want to use this fluorescent protein, I got to get it first, I got to build this, I got to do that. So we're trying to become uh, more of a one-stop shop for a lot of these different repair templates. Uh, so I'll skip over these slides, uh, but just to say, but I, I do want to mention the, the workflow of doing this. So everyone gets excited about tails as, oh, I, go, I want to use tails, I want to do something. It's a real commitment to doing a project, right? I mean, it's a multi-week process before you get the cells that you want. And it's not because of the tails per se. This would be true whether you're using talons, whether you're using CRISPRs, whether you're using zinc finger nucleases, whether you're using magic fairy dust to, uh, to provoke your homologous recombination. Because basically, you have to do single cell cloning. And that's the bottleneck. The means of generating the double strand break is basically irrelevant. The biggest bottleneck is the single cell cloning, uh, because none of these are even close to 100% efficient. You have to single cell clone, uh, so that's, that's the biggest bottleneck. So when you think about using tail reagents to create some cell line that you'd want, just know you'll have to go through a single cell cloning step at some point, and, and think about if that's something you want to do, if your cells will be amenable to that, et cetera. Uh, I'll skip over the variants too. Just the basic idea here is there's, there's a lot of different bells and whistles one might imagine putting into a tagging cassette, and we're starting to accumulate all of them. You know, different fluorophores, different selectable markers, different tags, et cetera. Uh,